My name is Carlos de la Rosa. I'm originally from Venezuela and uh, I did my studies in there, in university studies. I studied biology and I specialize in working with aquatic insects. Um, that's a branch of entomology, but I'm an ecologist. I look at what they do, what they eat, how they relate with each other, and how they relate with their environment. The specialty that I chose when I was a student was uh, to work with non-biking midges. Midges are tiny little insects related to mosquitoes, and uh, the non-biking midges are particularly rich in the number of species, and they live in freshwater systems, in streams and rivers and lakes and ponds, and tree holes, anywhere where water collects, they will, you will find midges in there. And they have many, many species, and very few of them have been uh, described, named, and studied in many great detail. I did my doctorate work in the University of Pittsburgh, and I studied uh, with a taxonomist. He's a person, he's an entomologist that describes new species. And the way that uh, he studied them is that he collected uh, all over the world here in Costa Rica with me and in Venezuela and in other places, collects the skins of one of the life stages of the insect, which are the pupa. The, it, this insects go through four life stages. The eggs, the larvae, the pupa, which is an intermediate stage between the larva and the, the adult. All of these that live in the water, when they become pupa, they transform and then they swim to the surface, the pupa opens up and boom, out comes the little adult and it goes flying to mate and lay the eggs. This little skin stays in the water, floating for about a day or two. And we collect them, mount them on little microscope slides and uh, are able to identify them. And so a lot of the work that I do with them is on the microscope because these insects are very, very tiny. And then through the microscope we can see a lot of details and we can do fantastic drawings like this. Where I started very early on uh, with my interest uh, in, in insects. I was about eight years old and my aunt was a seamstress. She had a studio in her house and she made clothes. And one of the things that uh, people that work in, in clothing uh, that they use is it's called a thread counter. And this is a very cool little loop because it has the lens in here, it has a frame in the bottom with a scale, and then when you put this on top of a piece of cloth, you can see and count how many threads per inch. This opened up a whole new world for me. So I borrowed it for about 40 years. <laughs> I still have it. This is the original. <laughs> I have many, many uh, lenses like this. I have one that I carry in my pocket, which is also 10x, and you can see the world from the perspective of an ant, or a midge, or a butterfly. If you don't have a loop or a magnifying lens, I would recommend you to have one, find one. It's a different world. It's a, it, the laws of physics are different. Uh, you can walk on water, you can float in the air, uh, gravity works different. It's a whole different world, and it's fascinating because you're going to be able to encounter many, many plants, animals, mosses, mites, that, uh, that normally we don't see and we take for granted. So it, for me, it's been a revelation to be able to explore that world and actually make a career out of it and live uh, professionally and make a living out of looking at things the same way that I looked at them when I was eight years old. Little microscope slides are already mounted and uh, in each of these slides there are tiny little exuvia and an exuvia is the skin that is left behind after an insect emerges from the pupil station to the adult. Looking at pupil exuvia as a way to inventory the fauna, plant, the animals that live on a given stream. And this is a particularly interesting way to do it because you're not actually killing anything, you're picking up things that are already discarded by the insects, but they're so detailed and have so much information in them that you can identify the species by looking at the little... It's like identifying a person by the clothes that it leaves behind in a pile. So I'm going to take one of these, put it on the microscope, turn it on. This will be five to $6,000. <laughs> these are very expensive. All of those, each of those squares and lines are, is, is an abdominal segment, the segment of the, kind of the belly of the insect. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight segments, and then... Look I'm looking through here, and this lets me see my hand, my pencil, on the other side. So I could look through here, and on this line, just like you're tracing. 
and do little drawings like this. So I could actually draw an insect very, very accurately because I'm tracing. It's like tracing. And so it's you're seeing cool. your pencil Yeah, I'm seeing this. my pencil through here mm -hmm. on top of the specimen. So wow. what from the microscope shows this. This is the abdomen. This is what we were seeing through the microscope. And then all of them are very different. They have different types of hairs and long hairs. And I can actually tell what species there are by looking at the different characters. Wow. These are drawings of a specimen, two species that were from India. And then we mount them just in the little microscope slides. And then did this very detailed drawings and describe these new species. They don't even have a name yet. It's the specimen drawing. It's Dehumidify, we take the humidity out and we have it really cold. So no other bugs come in here and the insects stay preserving these cabinets in trays that have specimens. Uh, here's one of the most spectacular ones. These are all insects that live here in La Selva and that people have collected. They dry them and mount them with little pins. They all have identifications, they have their names, uh, they have uh, the date that it was collected. Some of the largest insects in the world are found in here, like this giant rhinoceros beetle or the Hercules beetle. These are, these are the queens of leafcutter ants. When they're going to start a new nest, they have wings and they come out and then they start uh, flying. They mate with the males, the males die, and then these females are going to find a place where they can dig a hole and start their own colony and they're going to live for 25 or 30 years and they're going to produce 10 million daughters and uh, with that they would make the colonies and these colonies can be the size of a city block and very large with the fungus gardens and all that. So all, all the ones that I see marching around with their little sails are they're girls on their arm. They're and they're all, all girls. The same female. Wow. She made it once with two or three males and over the course of the next 25 years, she's going to use that sperm that she collected from those males and slowly fertilize the eggs. We have lots of specimens of species that were collected here. And these are the ones we use for teaching. They have big labels and they show their scientific name and the families and what kind. Of this is one of the several species of morphos that we have in here. Uh, I have another. When they land and close their wings, they disappear because they look like leaves. But when they're flying, they are iridescent. And what iridescence is, if you look at this one, I'm going to change the angle and you're going to see how the colors disappear. And they're actually brown and cream color. They are not blue. What they're doing is that depending on the angle of the light, it's going to reflect blue. So that's what's called iridescent. They're called glass wings because their wings are completely transparent. They don't have scales on the wings so you can see through them. Little membranes of these are green so when they land and close their wings they look like little leaves but when they're flying and they're looking for mates and they're flashing all of these colors so this is from these guys are katydids and they look so much like leaves that some of them even look like leaves that are dry or very fresh or leaves that have mosses on them these are little wasps and these are parasitic wasps and uh, there was a fellow from the British Museum of Natural History that came to study them and you notice there's one in here called Neotheronia rosae. It's this named one. after a guy called Carlos de la Rosa. I um, wonder who I, that is. And, uh, with my kids collecting with him and we found many new species. So he named three species after us. Neotheronia rosae, Neotheronia charlie for my son, and Neotheronia lizzie for my daughter. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's a way that the taxonomists of the people that describe new species honor uh, other people that have helped them or, or that are important to them by naming a species after them. So it is a little bit of a more bit of spiders and ants and different things. And uh, these are in alcohol and then they will stay, they have the labels of when they were collected and what they are and they will stay preserved like this in alcohol forever. And so why is this important? I mean it's fun to learn about insects and look at things that are miniature and work with microscopes and all these great toys. The whole world is filled with species. We're not the only species out there and we depend on many of these species for our own livelihood. Uh, if you go back a few thousand years when humans were not modernized, if you look at that forest, that forest was our pharmacy, 
That forest was our, our hardware store. That forest was our supermarket. Everything that we need has come at one point or another from the forest, from me. We depend on that forest like we depend now of our internet connections, of our police forces, and our cities, and our cars, and all that. So for us to know and understand what that forest needs to stay healthy and continue to help us live better lives, we need to protect it, we need to know it, and we need to love it. Well, fly fishing is uh, an extension of aquatic entomology. It's learning to know what fish eat, and they eat many aquatic insects, and also when are the different insects uh, emerging, so you could uh, match the hatch of the insects to the fish. And uh, they have created a whole industry of fly time and all that, but this one in particular was interesting. This is the larva of a dobson fly, and uh, it's about this same size and shape and color in the streams, but it's made out of plastic, and then uh, they put a hook on it and uh, use it as a so there are many kinds of aquatic ecosystems, rivers, streams and all that, but one of the most unusual are bromeliads. And bromeliads are plants that actually collect water inside the leaves. And in there, wherever there is water, there's going to be aquatic insects and other things that sometimes live nearby. So here, for example, we have a very large cricket that lives here in the access of the water. I don't know what he's eating. They normally feed on plants, but this, we find them often associated with the bromeliads. He's coming out. He's got blue eyes. Look how pretty it is. 